It's the uh, second week, if you're joining us, of our Outrageous series. So we're doing this three-week series in the build-up towards Christmas. And last week, Yvonne was looking at the theme of outrageous love. And this week, we're talking about outrageous hope. I've got to be honest, uh, this was one of the best topics I've ever been given to speak on. I, uh, I just think it's a great, great topic, a great word, hope. You know, to me, hope is one of if not the most central theme of the Christian message. Jesus came to bring us hope. Hope of a restored relationship between God and mankind. Hope of eternal life. Hope that our lives count for something. That we're a somebody, we can be useful, we're not here by accident, etc. You know, hope that we're not on our own. Even when everybody deserves us, that there is a God who is still there and still loves us. I love the word. I love that just the, the word hope. The thought of, of being people who are to share hope with those around us, with our communities, with our friends, with our families. I love the hope that my relationship with Jesus gives me. That the scriptures reveal about God's plan for my life. That the Holy Spirit's presence gives me. What does hope mean to you this morning? You know, as uh, thinking about Christmas, it's only, what, eight sleeps now? Seven sleeps? Seven sleeps. Yeah, I should know that probably. But um, I'm thinking about my, I was thinking about my kids, and they've got a whole list of things that they hope for. Well, more so Jocelyn than Beth. Beth doesn't really hope for anything. She just kind of gets that Santa's coming, and it's going to be great. And uh, she sees the tree and thinks there's something new to destroy in the house. And uh, she sees the chocolates in the morning and thinks, there's something I get to eat for breakfast that I don't normally get to eat. But Jocelyn has this whole list of things that she's hoping for. That, you know, the other week, you know, she was really urging me to go and post a letter to Father Christmas. You know, Daddy, go and post my letter. Make sure you post it, Daddy. Because she gets that, you know, if she's going to get something, then she needs to kind of send a letter off. And she's hoping now that Santa's got a letter and he's going to read those things. Little does she know that Santa's already skinned and uh, <laughs> he's already made the delivery to the cupboard upstairs. But uh, anyway, but you know that the, the, the hope of many children at Christmas is rooted in something which they want to happen, but they're not sure whether it will or not. They want it to happen, they want to get something, but they're not sure whether it will or whether it won't. Maybe they'll get some of the things, maybe not everything. But there's an uncertainty about their hope. Now, I looked up kind of the definitions of hope in our wonderful Oxford English Dictionary. And there were three things that came out. One was a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. A feeling of expectation and desire for something to happen. The second one was a person or thing that may help or save someone. I love that. The third was ground so believing that something good might happen. And fourth one was a feeling of trust. Hope is more than just wishing, right? It's about confidence. It's about expectancy. It's about assurance. It's something to hold on to. Not something to be unsure about. There's a couple of quotes I pulled off the internet about hope, and I just want to share a few of these with you. So one of this was this, that a single thread of hope is a very powerful thing. A single thread. Another one was, where there is hope, there is faith. And where there is faith, miracles can happen. How about that? Where there is hope, there is faith. And where there is faith, miracles can happen. Here was another one. Hope is not a strategy. Without a plan, hope is just an idea. So that, again, implies that hope is more than just a concept. There is more to it than that. There is a back to the front, if you like. You know, the Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Phil was sharing that before. To not have hope is an awful thing. That's Proverbs 13, 12. You know, as Christians, though, we're meant to be carriers of hope wherever we go. People are meant to look at us and see the hope that Jesus gives us. 
and understand that we have something that they don't. In the book of 1 Peter 3.15, there is this phenomenal scripture which says this, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone that asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared. How prepared do you feel this morning? You know, in the Amplified Bible, that same scripture reads like this. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anybody who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance elicited by faith that is within you. A logical defense. And still again, the message says this, through thick and thin, keep your heart's attention in adoration before Christ your master. Be ready to speak up and tell anybody who asks you why you're living the way you are. In the book of Hebrews 6, verses 18 to 20, the Bible says this, we who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God where Jesus running ahead of us has taken up a permanent post as high priest for us. That's from the message, Hebrews 6, if you want to look that up later. Do you feel full of hope this morning? Do you? I'm hoping that I'm going to, you know, bring some hope today. Restore your confidence. G you up a little bit, you know? How can we remind ourselves of the hope that we've got through our relationship with God, day in, day out? How can we show others that our hope is not just a thing, but it's actually outrageous? It's out of this world. It is something that stands out from everything else that the world has to offer. Because that's what it's about, right? right. It's not just another hope that we have. What we have is the hope. The hope. The hope. So I'm going to keep this pretty simple this morning, but I want to remind you of just what salvation in Jesus is about, what it gives us, and how we should be living in light of that every day. So here we go. The first point I'd like to make this morning is there is a hope for your past. There is a hope for your past. You know, to understand hope, you have to understand that there's a time when we didn't have hope. You have to understand what it feels like to not have hope. Simple concept, right? You can't know what it's like to have something until you don't know what it's like to not have it or to have missed it. You know, the Bible uses the analogy a lot of lost things to describe the difference between people who know Jesus, are in relationship with him, and people who aren't. And Jesus tells several parables about that, you know, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and maybe the most obvious being the prodigal son or the lost son. People who are lost and found. I don't know if you've ever found yourself being lost, but it's not a nice feeling. It's pretty horrendous, actually, and it can conjure all kinds of feelings of fear, anxiety, blind panic, as well as other things such like confusion, frustration, and even anger. You get angry about the situation. Why don't I know where I'm going, you know? I've, uh, I've been lost a few times in my life, but one of the most uh, memorable ones was when I was on holiday when I was about 12 in Mallorca with my mum and dad. I, um, my brother and I had gone up to this arcade place, and we were playing on the arcade machines. That's not the gambling machines, just to be clear. It's the you know, old-fashioned Street Fighter II type things that you used to put 50p in and, you know, back in the day when they were popular. But uh, you know what happened was my brother and I, we were up there. We spent a couple of hours playing on the arcade machines, spent all our cash for the night, and, um, and then he was going to go up to this firework display or something with a girl he'd met on holiday and he asked me do I want to come and I kind of felt like a third wheel you know I'm sure you can relate to that so I thought well no I'll go back to the hotel it wasn't it was only a short walk and he said to me my brother's older than me six years older so at the time I I was about 12 he would have been 18 he said you know the way back and I said yeah it's fine just go down the road and the hotel's just there on the left and um, and he was like yeah no problems just crack on then so off I went followed my kind of sense of direction to the bottom of the road, and then I took the turn, and then the hotel wasn't there. So I kind of walked back, followed my steps, walked around a bit more, and I got to the point where I'd walked that circuit three or four times, and I realized all of a sudden, I said, I don't know where I'm going. Where's the hotel gone? Now, that, the feeling of kind of walking around an unfamiliar place, when you can't speak the language, knowing that you're close to where you need to be, 
but you're not there, and you might never find your way. It's not a nice one. In the end, I'd, I'd kind of walk past this spa a few times, and I, I walked in, and in the end, I had enough common sense to say, where's this hotel? And the people who couldn't speak a word of English got the fact that I was a young English boy on holiday and didn't know where I was going and phoned the police, and the police gave me an escort back to the hotel. And then I made up a story that my brother abandoned me <laughs> to cover up my own mistakes. Do you know, though, as bad as that was, that feeling when I was lost was nowhere as bad as the feeling when you're looking for a lost person. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. This summer, I had one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Well, it took, um, took the girls away to a friend's caravan up at the coast in Bridlington, and we went for the day to Filey in the middle of the summer. And you know what it's like in Britain? The slightest glimpse of sunshine, that's it. Shorts are on, T-shirts are on, factor zero, because we, just, we know it's going to go tomorrow, so burn me, you know. So we, uh, we ventured down to Filey, and uh, we're on the beach, and uh, I think Janina had gone to get some ice creams for the girls, and I had the girls near the, um, the sea, and we just splashed in the waves, you know, that kind of thing, and um, I could see her walking back, so I shouted to the kids, come on, mummy's, mummy's back with the ice creams, let's go and get an ice cream. And uh, they were really close to me, but Jocelyn being as excitable as she is, she was like, right, ice cream, yes! You know, you think she'd never had an ice cream before, but she was like, she ran ahead, and... Um, and then she wandered off. Didn't mean to wander off, just kind of got misdirected. And for about 45 minutes, we searched that beach. I have to be honest with you, I was, I was desperate, I was terrified. All I could think of was this beach was lined with people. So many people. And I'd run up and down it, I'd shout at her, I couldn't see her anywhere. And I could just, all I could think of, and this may sound awful, was the film Taken. If you've seen that film, you'll know what I mean. And I was just like, that's it. My little girl's gone. I'm never going to see her again. She's gone. And it got even more real when we were on the phone to the Coast Guard. Just about to ask them to send a search party out for her. It was one of the most horrendous feelings I've ever had in my entire life. But then... Praise God, this lady who had heard, seen us searching, had gone with her dog up to the far end of the beach, and she'd found her. And I saw her walking back, calm as anything, as if there was nothing wrong in the world. But then she saw me, and she just lost it. In that moment, all those feelings of confusion and where's my mom and where's my dad caught up with her, and she was just distraught. And I was relieved. I was so relieved. You know, that feeling of sheer and utter joy that my little girl who was lost wasn't lost anymore. She was safe. I'll never forget that. Do you know, that's how the Bible puts it. We were lost. Now we're found. Often when we think of our salvation, we can release it, bring, reduce it down to this logical thing or even a theological concept. Even for some people, it's like an add-on to your life. You know, we have our family life, we have our work life, we have our spiritual life. It's a box that we can tick. It's a destination that we arrive at. But you know, salvation is not just that. It's a very much an emotional thing. It's desperation. It's about life and death. You were a child walking on a beach surrounded by threats. You were alone. You were headed in the wrong direction. You couldn't care for yourself. The enemy had you in his sights. You were destined for harm and destruction. You had no hope. And then Jesus stepped in. Jesus stepped in. It's so easy to forget that sin, which is what the Bible calls the wrong things we do, the wrong thoughts we think, it's a chasm that separates us between God and mankind. One that can never be like crossed by just doing your right thing, living the right way, right thinking, good deeds, doing your best, or even hoping to get to heaven. 
It doesn't work like that. The Bible says this, there is one God and one mediator between us and God, and that's Jesus, who offered himself in exchange for our sin. 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 7. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. We forget that we were without hope. We had no hope. We were sinners. And God pursued us. He searched for us. He longed for us. He made a way for us. He reached out for us in his care, and he offers to us to come back into his family. Through his love. Romans 5, 6 says, You see, just at the right time, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Another translation says, while we were still powerless. You had no power to save yourself. Jesus was the one who had the power. This week, we had our Salvation Army regional manager get together. And we had a, a short devotional time before we went out for a carvery. It was awkward, I'll be honest with you. Oh, man. Like six people in a room with a CD player singing carols, most of which couldn't sing. Oh, man. It won't be like that next Sunday, don't worry. But it was horrendous. But one of the best things about the little devotional time was um, they read this little passage from a book by Max Lucado called An Angel's Story. I don't know if anyone's read it. But it talks about just the heart of God in leaving heaven to come to earth. And I just want to share it with this short excerpt with you this morning, if that's okay. And this says this. It says, The king walked over and reached for the book. He turned towards Lucifer and commanded, Come, deceiver, read the name of the one who will call your bluff. Read the name of the one who's going to storm your gates. Satan rose slowly off his haunches like a weary wolf. He walked a wide circle towards the desk until he stood before the volume and read the word, Emmanuel, he muttered to himself, then spoke in a tone of disbelief, God with us. For the first time, the hooded head turned squarely towards the face of the father. No, not even you do that. Not even you would go so far. You've never believed me, Satan, God said. But Emmanuel, the plan is bizarre. You don't know what it's like on earth. You don't know how dark I've made it. It's evil. It's mine, said the king. And I will reclaim what's mine. I will become flesh. I will feel what my creatures feel. I will see what they see. But what of their sin? I'll bring mercy. What of the death? I'll give life. Satan stood speechless. God spoke, I love my children. Love does not take away the beloved's freedom, but love takes away fear. And Emmanuel will leave behind the tribe of fearless children. They won't fear you and they won't feel your hell. Satan stepped back and thought his retort was charged. They will too. I will take away all sin. I will take away death. Without sin, without death, you have no power. Around and around in a circle, Satan paced, clenching and unclenching his fingers. When he finally stopped, he asked a question that even I was thinking, why? Why would you do this? The father's voice was deep and soft. Because I love them. Don't forget, you were without hope. Just when you were, God stepped in. God made a way. Jesus came and bridged the gap for us. Jesus paid the price for our sins. Hands that threw stars into space, as the hymn said. They humbled themselves to take the form of a little baby in a working class family, to be born in a stable surrounded by animals and muck. Creator allowed creation to give birth to him, to raise him, to clean him, to clothe him, to feed him, even to educate him. And then to mock him, to scorn him, to arrest him, torture him, nail him to a cross, murder him, bury him, mourn him. Without Jesus, there is no hope. Without Jesus, we would still be lost. Don't forget what it cost him. It's outrageous. Jesus came to deal with your sin, your mistakes, your past. Whatever you've done wrong in your life, Jesus has paid the price for it through his death on the cross. The Bible says he literally became sin for us. And it says as he was hanging there, 
Just before he took his last breath, he cried out three words. Remember? It is finished. Every sin, every misdeed, every moral failure, every wrong thought, every addiction, every cross word you've ever spoken, all their power was broken in that moment. The Bible says, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 10.13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Come on. Does that give us hope this morning? Come on. There's a friend of my dad's called Arthur White. He um, used to be a power lifter, famous one. Works for a ministry now called Tough Talk. Some of you may have heard of it. Arthur has this thing whenever you meet him and you say, hey, Arthur, how you doing? He'll respond by saying, I'm saved and assured, brother. <laughs> now, you may laugh at that, but when you understand Arthur's life and what it was like before he was a Christian, the fact that, he, you know, he used to carry a six-inch carving diver's knife on his arm for fear of his life, the fact that he'd made thousands of pounds and drugs and black markets and had people out to get to him. The fact that his life is no longer filled with darkness, but he has hope. You understand what it means to be saved and assured. Yes, yes. When you've not had hope, right. you should understand what it is yes. to have hope again. Because of Jesus, we have that hope. Yes. Don't forget where you came from. Yes. You might not be like Arthur, but you were a sinner. Right. And now you're a saint, yes. and it's only because of Jesus. There is a reason to celebrate the hope that you have because of the time when we didn't have any. Let's move on. The second thing I want to say to you this morning is that you have hope, not just for your past, but for your present and for your future. You see, not only has our salvation taken us from a place of no hope to being full of hope, the scriptures are filled with hundreds of promises about our God's love for us as well as his assurance of peace and guidance and his presence with us throughout our lives whilst ever we're here on the earth and even beyond that. Just a few scriptures I'll share this morning. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. <coughs> Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength in my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 91, 14 and 15. God is our ever-present refuge and strength. I help in times of trouble. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me. And I will answer. James 1 verse 5, if anyone acts, lacks wisdom, let him ask of the Lord. Matthew 6, come to me, all you are weary, I will give you rest. Matthew 28, 20, surely I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound so that at all things, at all times, in every situation, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. You know, the Bible is full of truths about what it, what it is life is like or should be like for those who follow Jesus. And it's clear that we should be people who are full of hope. These truths should give us more than hope as well. It's about, they should give us that confidence that we have a God who's not only by our side, but who's actively and wants to actively be involved in our lives. Stephen Furtick says this, he says, the evidence of hope isn't in something we see, it's in someone we know. The evidence of hope isn't in something we see, it's in someone we know. If you've got an iPhone, or an iPhone 4 onwards, then you may have used at one point a little gadget called Siri. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Siri, that little voice that goes, how can I help you? Yeah. What do you want? What do you want, Mary? That's what he says, isn't it? 
You know, when Apple released the iPhone 4 in 2011, they decided that they were going to take the idea of like a Google search and all the stuff that was on the internet and make all that accessible for people who own the phone at the touch of a button. So they, they figured that the internet is a fast and it's a confusing place. So they make it easier for their customers by introducing a feature that can find what you want by voice activation alone. Now, when it first came out, it's fair to say it took a little bit of time to get some traction. But now, like, the technology is so good that you can use Siri to set up reminders on your phone, search the internet for you, create alarms, voice notes, send messages and make calls on behalf of you, even generate bookings for a restaurant all at the command of your voice. And they've even developed the function so far that you can even have a joke with Siri if you want to, and if you've got time on your hands. So if you go home and you want something to do while you're having your Sunday lunch, ask him to rap, ask him to sing, ask him to read a poem to you and a story. They're all things that he'll do if you ask him. You can argue back and he'll even give you a sarcastic comment. That's how much they've developed this technology. As long as you can connect to the internet, Siri can draw on the vast resources of the internet and hotlink you to any kind of information you need, providing guidance as required. It's amazing, really, when you think about it. You know, God is ever-present. He's omnipresent. He's always there. He doesn't miss a trick. You don't have to get his attention or bend his ear. You don't have to push a button. You know, God sees you. He hears you. He knows your thoughts, your feelings, your desires. When Jesus died, he made a way for us to have direct access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we don't just have access to his presence, but to all of his resources. It's amazing. You think about that. God, the God of all gods... There's only one God, we know that. But the God of gods, the president of presidents, who has no rival, no equal, no competition, who was there at the beginning of time and will one day call the universe and life as we know it to an end, the God who has never known what it is to have a boss, a bank manager, a therapist, whose accounts have always and will always be in the black permanently, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the hills as well, you know, God offers us not just the opportunity to connect with him, but the assurance of his companionship. Day in, day out, and the next day, forever. You know, when you think about that, it really is amazing. You know? That is the God that we pray to. That is the God that when we read our Bible, it talks about. That is the God who answers our prayers. It's not just like he's throwing you a favor once in a while. God loves us. He is for us. The Bible says that if God is for us, ask yourself, who can be against you? No, do your friends and family, do your work colleagues, do they see that hope in you? Do they see that hope in you? Do they see that confidence that God is with you and at work in your circumstances? Are you living victoriously? Are you a positive person? You should be. You should be if you know Jesus. I know that we all have different personalities and all that, but the truth is the truth, right? The truth is the truth. God is for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? You know, your life is safe in his hands this morning. Does that mean everything's trouble-free? No. But because of God's love and his companionship, you'll never face a set of circumstances alone. All the time, wherever you are, God is watching you. He is with you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you don't need to get yourself into some kind of spiritual frenzy to get his attention. You don't need to use flowery big words. You don't need a passport to cross the border of heaven or into some kind of spiritual premiership. No, you can speak to God right now. Hear from him right now. It's amazing. Do you carry that with you every day? That is the hope that we have. It's not just our past that's been dealt with, but our future, our present. God is with us in every situation.
He's for us. And that will never change. The final point. We have a hope for eternity. We talked about our past being dealt with, our present and our future, that God is with us, but we have a hope for eternity. You know, one of life's biggest mysteries for many is what happens when I die? You ever think about that? You know, that source of, the question is a source of fear, anxiety for many people, including Christians. A lot of Christians, even though they have put their trust in Jesus, still fear death. There are many, many theories about what happens when we die. If you look at the different religions and philosophies throughout the world. I, uh, I kind of Googled some of these and uh, found an, an, an article that MSN ran just in October, just gone. And uh, this was called 20 Theories on Life After Death. Well, I'm not going to share 20, but here's a few of them that people believe. And these people obviously aren't Christians. There are other philosophies that exist. See how hopeful you find them. So some quantum physicists apparently believe that life creates the universe and that after our bodies die, our consciousness lives on. So if there wasn't for our consciousness, there would be no universe. Bizarre. Tim Burton. Now, I'm interested as to why Tim Burton, who's a director of films, if anybody knows, directed Batman, Beetlejuice, a bunch of other things, Nightmare Before Christmas. You know, Tim Burton gets an opinion on this apparently these days. And his, ver his view of life after death is that when we die, our bodies get stuck in ghost form in a parallel dimension. That's straightforward, isn't it? <laughs> apparently, they can only be freed by certain types of exorcists, so... If you're a Buddhist, then one in six options await you. You could become a god, if you strike lucky, a demigod, a human and animal, a hungry ghost, or just sent to the realm of hells. Hindus believe that you will be reincarnated 52 million times before you eventually crock it properly. And you can start at anything from plant level to a human. If you believe in solipsism, which I have not heard of until about three days ago, you're the only person alive anyway, and everyone else is just a figment of your imagination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The philosopher antiquity, he believed that after death comes judgment. Well, that's full of hope, isn't it? The good, they go to the islands of the blessed, where the bad ones would be chastised. The Aztecs used to believe that if you were a soldier and you died in battle, then you'd be reincarnated as a butterfly. Or a hummingbird. Four years, though, after your demise. You have to wait four years, and then you'll be reincarnated. If you drown, though, you go straight to heaven. So there is a blessing to be had in every cloud. Everyone else, though, just spends four years in hell before dying. So. If you're a Rasta, then uh, they believe that heaven is in Ethiopia. So if you're good, you'll, when you die, you get to visit a third world country where most people struggle to eat and find food, and the infant mortality rate is 68%. Sounds like paradise, doesn't it? The pharaohs believed that death was only temporary, which is why they preserved their bodies. Because after a while, you come back, so you need to look after your body. And finally, some of the scientists believe that we are the dream of some superior alien race and that we only cease to exist when they die. <laughs> now, depending on your outlook with life, you may find some of them hopeful. However, I personally wouldn't like to be a ghost, a butterfly, or a hummingbird. Uh, I don't want to see out my eternity in Ethiopia. And actually, I believe I'm made for more than just being the product of an alien's dream. You know, as Christians, we have a hope that goes beyond the grave. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says this, verses 50 to 56. I declare to you, brothers and sisters... Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must close itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. If you follow Jesus this morning, 
Death has lost its power over you. Death has lost its sting. You know, the message puts that same passage like this. Let me tell you something wonderful. A mystery I'll probably never fully understand. We're not all going to die, but we will all be changed. You'll hear a blast to end all blasts from a trumpet. In that time, you'll look up and blink your eyes. It's over. On a signal from that trumpet in heaven, the dead will be up and out of their graves, beyond the reach of death, never to die again. At that same moment and in the same way, we'll all be changed. In the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen. Everything perishable taken off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable. This mortal replaced by the immortal. Then the same will come true. Death swallowed up by triumphant life. Who got the last word, death? Oh, death, who's afraid of you now? As Christians, we have a hope that goes beyond the grave. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believed in him would never die but have everlasting life. Romans 10 verse 9 to 10 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. If you place your trust in Jesus, eternity is secure. It will be today and the next day too and the day after that. As Christians, we have a hope for eternity. This week, my boss, um, Tony, sadly lost his wife. She'd been in um, a battle for some time with a brain tumor. And um, a couple of weeks back, they'd been told she had several months. And then it was reduced to two weeks. And then she didn't even see that. It was really, really sad. But I have to honor Tony that through all of it, he's maintained his faith in God. And he kept just saying to us, I'm in God's hands. We're in God's hands. We've got a tremendous amount of peace. You see, the thing is, death is sad for those who are left behind, but our spirits are promoted to glory. To a place where our hope, our God is ever present, where we can live without fear, without shame, without pain, in paradise, as we are always intended to live. Revelation 21 says this, I saw heaven and a new earth created. Gone was the first heaven, And the first earth, gone was the sea. I saw the holy Jerusalem, new created, descending, resplendent out of heaven, as ready for God as a bride for her husband. Then I heard a voice thunder from the throne that said, Look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They're his people. He's their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. The enthroned continued, look, I'm making everything new. Write it down, each word dependable and accurate. We have hope for eternity. You don't need to be afraid of death this morning if you've placed your trust in Jesus.